So welcome to the Education Advisory Board site visit. I'm very excited to see so many people from across the campus here. Um, I know most of you, um, but I'm not sure if you all know me. I'm Phyllis Hoffman. I'm Assistant Chancellor and Chief of Staff to the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost uh, George Breslauer. And um, I am hosting this visit along with my colleagues, Diana Wu and Cynthia Schrager, who you'll hear from later this morning. Um, as you may recall from the invitation for this event, um, Berkeley is a member of the Education Advisory Board, which is a best practices research organization. And um, one of the parts of our membership is for us to have the EAB come here and do um, site visits for us, do an overview of their services, and to share some of their best practices research. So that's what this morning is about, and, and we're excited to have you here with us. Um, before I turn the floor over to Laura Pact, um, I wanted to just go over a couple of things with you. First, you'll see that we are being taped, um, and we're doing this for people that couldn't be here today who may want to see this later, so we'll be loading this up um, on our website so folks can watch this. Um, also, in terms of the program, the first hour is going to be an overview of our um, EAB membership and the benefits of that. We'll take a break. Some people may leave, other people may arrive, and then we'll turn to the digital strategy roadmap, um, and we'll talk about that for about an hour and a half, and then we'll break shortly before noon. So that is the plan for the day. And for those of you that are not familiar with Dwinnell, restrooms are out that way and to the left. Okay. My pleasure to introduce Laura Pact. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you for the great introduction, Phyllis, and it's wonderful to be here. Um, it's about 95 degrees in DC, so this is a very nice break for us. Um, thank you all for joining. Just by way of introduction, again, my name is Laura Pact, and I serve as UC Berkeley's dedicated advisor for their three memberships with the Education Advisory Board. We'll dive into which three of those memberships you all have in a few slides. Um, I've been at the Education Advisory Board now for a year and three months, um, and I actually come from more of a K-12 background, so I did new teacher recruitment for a series of nonprofits and for DC public schools. Um, so a little bit about me. And today's presentation, and please tell me if I'm getting too close to the mic, just go like this or make a pained expression. Um, today's presentation will really be focused on three different areas. Oh, so the first, for those of you who EAB is completely new to you, um, I will go through a quick overview of the history of EAB and where we come from and what we do. Uh, the definite biggest part of the presentation will focus on our services. So what are all of the membership services that we offer and how do you access them? And then finally, I get to be quiet for a little bit and hear from you about you know, the projects and priorities that are on your plate, um, especially as we enter this new school year. And I'm very, very informal, so if you have questions or comments um, at any point throughout the presentation, just go ahead and interrupt me. So for a quick look at the history of the Education Advisory Board, um, we are actually a subsidiary of the Advisory Board Company more broadly. And the Advisory Board Company was founded in Washington, D.C. over 30 years ago to conduct best practices research and consulting for the healthcare field. Um, interestingly enough, the work of EAB actually sprung out of our work with hospitals and health systems. Um, in particular, deans of medical schools kept coming up to us and saying, you know, a lot of this similar type research would be really useful for folks in the higher ed industry if you thought of expanding there. So after hearing this time and time again, we finally did respond to our, to our members' request and launched the Academic Affairs Forum in 2007. So while we EAB has only been in existence for about six years. We are fortunate to draw off of 30 plus years of experience conducting best practices research. So along the bottom of the slide is an idea of our broader portfolio at EAB. So we have our Academic Affairs Forum, which of course is why we're all here today. That's strategy, advice, and research for deans and provosts and other academic administrators. We have our Business Affairs Forum, which is research for chief business officers and their leadership teams. We have our Student Affairs Forum, which Berkeley is also a member of, uh, Research for Student Affairs Executives. We have our COE Forum, COE standing for Continuing an Online Education Forum, which Berkeley is also a member of, uh, Breakthrough Practice Research and Market Intelligence for Online Education Executives. We have our Community College Forum, which as the name would suggest, works with our community college members. And then finally, about 
six to eight months ago, I'm losing track of time now, we did launch our most recent forum, the Advancement Forum. And that provides breakthrough practice research and data analytics for advancement and development professionals. So that's a look at our six, what we call research and insights memberships, which are research, I'm sorry, memberships that are focused on our best practices research. And again, you all have the Academic Affairs Forum, the COE Forum, and the Student Affairs Forum. Then we also have two performance collaboratives. I think I call them performance technologies. I think it's a little bit clearer. Um, but these are very comprehensive software solutions. So again, very dissimilar from our uh, research memberships. And those are the University Spend Collaborative, uh, which provides business intelligence and price benchmarking to ultimately reduce procurement spend. And SSC, which I've seen a demo of, it's incredibly impressive, which stands for the Student Success Collaborative. Um, and that's a predictive modeling and degree tracking software uh, that with the goal of improving retention and completion. So that is a look at our broader portfolio, the six research and insights memberships and our two performance technologies. All right, I will not go through the slide line by line, don't worry, but I did want to give you idea, an idea of our partial membership list. So it's funny, we can't update the top of the slide fast enough. We now work with over 500 institutions, not 450. Um, but this really gives you an idea of the diversity of our membership base. So we work with flagship state research universities, public research universities, Canadian institutions, community colleges. Uh, point being, you name it, we work with them. And this comes uh, at a great advantage. We're completing our best practices research because we have such a diverse array of perspectives to rely on uh, within our own membership base. I want to provide a quick note on how we conduct our research. And I never like having a researcher in the room because they're always rolling their eyes or correcting me. So this will be a very high level overview. <laughs> but I do want to point to the fact that our research year every year starts with a member topic poll. Um, we're extremely member div driven at the Education Advisory Board. And at the beginning of every research year, we do send out an annual topic poll It'll, to all of our members. And it says, you know, of these 20 to 30 topics, which are most top of mind for you, which are keeping you up at night? Um, and not surprisingly, the top three to four tend to uh, have a great degree of overlap between the members. They're all sort of focused on similar issues. And so that's how we really set our research agenda for the year. Once our research agenda is set, um, I like to think, again, not being a researcher, it's simpler for me to think of it as a constant narrowing down and winnowing down process. So we start with thousands of interviews with institutions across the country, both within and outside of our membership. So I typically get the question, do you only talk to people in your membership? Absolutely not. Um, we talk to institutions both within and outside of our membership base. Um, and, and just get a sense of the implementation requirements, the benefits, the drawbacks, the pros, the cons of, of a given best practice area. And then from there, the, the slide column titled Exhaustive Screening, again, refers to this narrowing down process. Where we're really screening to find true best practice. I like to define best practice because it's something you'll hear me say a lot. And so we generally define best practice in, in three main ways. Um, so number one, the practice must be truly innovative. So it can't be something we've seen before. It must be truly innovative. Uh, number two, it must have a demonstrated track record of success at a given institution. And because we work with such a diverse array of institutions, the practice must be replicable at an institution of varying size, shape, Carnegie classification, et cetera. And so then finally, once we really get down to our maybe between 10 and 20 profiled best practices, that's when we synthesize, get our heads around everything, and ultimately present those best practices to our membership at our national meetings. So again, very high level overview of our research process. So I do want to go through the major initiatives that we're tackling in each forum. Um, so Phyllis asked me, you know, besides academic affairs, let's take a look at what we're doing in COE and student affairs as well, since there's a, a mixed audience in the room. Uh, so for academic affairs, this is a look at our major initiatives. Um, we're taking on a pretty big uh, load this year. Um, so we've actually looked at this as a two-year agenda. So the number one and number two are what we're presenting at our current national meeting series. And three and four are actually coming down the pike uh, in the back half of 2014. So this is a two-year agenda. Um, but to look at what we're presenting right now, um, we have Future Students, Future Revenues, which is actually a shared topic between Academic Affairs Forum and Student Affairs Forum. So you'll see this pop up again. So this is all about what student segments will grow or recede both domestically and globally in the next five to 10 years, and what are the advantage in enrollment and recruitment strategies for reaching these new students. 
We have our online strategy roadmap. I will touch on this lightly because you're going to see the entire thing uh, after I'm done. Um, but this is all about you know, taking our work on MOOCs uh, to the next level and actually looking at the implementation requirements uh, for fully online and hybrid courses. So what are the critical student engagement and support services required for online courses? And then further, we have a section called build, buy, or partner. So should we build, buy, or partner for you know, online course development and marketing? But again, you'll see all of this, which is great. And then coming down the pike in the back half of 2014 um, will be our Student Success Transformation Center and our Program Sustainability Dashboard Builder. And these are going to look less like the traditional best practices publication and presentation. These will actually be online resource centers and tools. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that we're you know, providing our research, giving our national meetings, and giving our research presentations, but then also providing a lot of tools and resources online, because when you get back to campus, that's typically where you're going to turn. So the Student Success Transformation Center um, will be a one-stop shop for all of our best work on student success and retention. Um, we'll obviously draw in existing work, but we have a new staff member actually that joined a few months ago that will be leading the charge on a lot of new work in the student success area. And again, that will all be contained in this center that's going to come online about 2014. And the Program Sustainability Dashboard Builder, again, less of a traditional best practice publication or presentation, and more of a personalized diagnostic for our members, all about key performance indicators and metrics. So what are the key performance indicators and metrics that we should be tracking, and how do you present these in the most compelling way possible? So that is a quick look at what we're covering in the Academic Affairs Forum, and I'm glad that you'll get to hear a full presentation shortly um, from the Academic Affairs Forum. So let's turn to uh, the COE Forum. So to give you a look, this uh, agenda was just rolled out about a week ago, so we're really excited about this. And again, same thing. We're looking at this in more of a, across the next two years, what do we want to tackle? Um, so one and two will be presented at our winter national meeting series, with three and four coming down the pike in 2014. Uh, so the first presentation that we'll be giving uh, in 2013 in our national meeting series is called Innovations in Branding and Pricing. And this is all about what aid and payment strategies appeal most to price-sensitive students, um, and how are innovators using freemium online courses to build brand awareness. We have our Industry Futures Center, uh, which builds off of our work with Burning Glass, uh, which is an artificial intelligence data mining engine that provides really comprehensive and sophisticated market demand reports for our members. And this is all about what are the fastest growing new jobs and skills that are required by employers across the country? Where are the hottest emerging fields? And where are there new opportunities for growth in already in high demand fields like healthcare, IT, business, and education? Then we have the Student Experience Transformation Center. So we'll be a similar idea as the advanced, or I'm sorry, the Academic Affairs Forum Student Success Transformation Center. Again, a, a compilation of resources and tools related to improving the online student experience. So it'll be resources in career advancement, online community, alumni engagement, um, early alert systems, et cetera, all sort of captured in this one place so it's much easier for you all to access. And finally, we have engaging the campus in online and professional education. Um, again, most likely coming down the pike in the back half of 2014. And this is all about helping campus leaders understand the true costs, risk, costs, risks, and opportunities of online education and professional programs. So a very high-level look of what we're doing in the COE form over the next few years. And finally, let's go to student affairs, see what we're doing in that, uh, that forum as well. So I won't repeat the future students, future revenues, but just a reminder that this is a shared uh, presentation between student affairs, academic affairs, and our business affairs folks, um, very intentionally so, so that CBOs, provosts, and VPSAs are all leaving with the same information to have really strategic conversations about growth um, on campus. Same thing here. Oh, actually, no, different. So we're doing one, two, and three this year, uh, with four coming down the pike again in 2014. Um, but number two is all about supporting emergent student pop emerging student populations with a big focus on international students. Um, even at last year's Student Affairs Forum meetings, um, our members were saying, we, we need you to tackle international students. Um, so we really want to see you do something in this area. So this is our response to, uh, to that need from our members. 
So this is all about what high impact resources and services and strategies uh, best support international student engagement. And we'll also be answering the question of, of how do we connect, con uh, provide more connection and engagement with domestic and international students. So where are those opportunities for overlap between those two populations of students? We have reimagining digital services, I'm sorry, student services in a digital area, uh, which is all about what are the critical student engagement tools and online support services. Um, this topic was actually, as of a day ago, recently tweaked a bit based on feedback from our members to also include a piece on the, the student online presence. So with things like Facebook and Twitter being increasingly looked upon by employers um, and, and increasingly scrutinized, you know, how are we training students to have a, a relevant and meaningful and appropriate online presence? So that'll be a big part of this presentation as well. And then finally, we have a similar resource center coming down the pike in 2014 about key performance indicators and metrics, which is really important um, for every one of our members in every forum. Um, so what are the key productivity, mission, and financial metrics we should be tracking? And which information should be shared, should be shared with boards versus institution leaders uh, versus students and their families? And that was a lot of information, um, but that's what we'll be taking on within the Student Affairs Forum. Again, one, two, three this year, and then four coming down the pike in 2014. All right, so now we get into my favorite slide in the deck because this really encompasses my role um, at EAB, which is dedicated advisor. And what that means is that I am essentially your, the steward of the resources that you've committed to EAB, and it's my job to help you get the maximum value possible out of your memberships with EAB. So we're gonna go through each of these membership services in great depth, so I'll just go ahead and jump right in. So how many folks, if you could just raise your hand, have been to eab.com, have been to our website? Oh, okay, a lot, great. Um, so obviously, since so many have been to the website, you know that it is a powerhouse and, and warehouse of information and resources. Um, we actually relaunched our website completely about a year ago at this point. So we put a lot of resources into our website recently to make it even easier to use, even easier to search. So if you don't have an account, for the five people or so that don't have an account on the website, I'm looking at you, and um, you should definitely go and create one um, at www.eab.com. You basically just need to use your Berkeley email address to make sure it's recognized in the system. But once you're in, it's a great place Place to just peruse, see what we have, get a sense of what's there, um, because there are just a, a lot of resources online uh, for your use. We also have our forum email updates. So obviously members are saying we don't want to be bugged every day, but we do want some kind of automatic reminder that, hey, we have this membership, here's a new resource that's rolled out, we want to stay connected with you all. So we do provide email updates. They come at the most three times a month, typically more like two times a month, so they're not overly uh, uh, cumbersome to you all. And they provide just a quick bulleted, here's a new custom project we just rolled out that we think is especially relevant. Here's our national meeting agenda. Here's a new webinar. Um, so it's a very nice automatic reminder of, hey, we have this membership. Let me go ahead and click in um, and, and see what you all are doing right now. Um, so I typically go ahead and add everyone to the email lists, but certainly if you don't want to receive the emails, you can, uh, you can opt out. But I find that they're a very helpful reminder and a way to stay connected with EAB. Insight centers, so this is actually exciting. We have launched these insight centers in academic affairs, advancement form, and business affairs, and I just got an email last night that we, they're now live for student affairs. So what are insight centers? Um, insight centers are really another response that we've had to our members saying, we, we want you to be even easier to use. You know, we want to go online and, and be able to easily find things. So what we've done is we've created these one-stop shops for perennial key issue areas in each of our forums. So using academic affairs form as an example, student success and retention, faculty affairs, globalization, again, these perennial issue areas, we've created a one-stop shop where you can click in and see all of our best and most relevant resources in a given area. So point being, it's not everything we've ever done on faculty affairs because that's literally hundreds of resources to comb through, but our research team has gone through and handpicked certain resources for inclusion in these insight centers. So if you're on an online education strategy committee, for example, the Online Education Strategy Insight Center is a great place to go to, to get smart in the course of an afternoon. So these are all live on the website. If you go to our homepage um, in any of our forums, except for, I guess, COE is next, um, it'll say Access Insight Centers. You click right in and you can get right to all this material. So 
So Hot Topic Web Conferences, and Colin has done some of these, are another membership service that we offer. Uh, these are typically rolled out at the conclusion of our national meeting series each year. And these are hour-long focused presentations of the year's meeting content. So for example, the digital strategy roadmap presentation that you're about to see takes about two hours, can even go longer at a meeting. It'll be broken down into hour-long focused webinars. And I see these functioning really well in, in two basic examples. So one, if you've come to a national meeting and really want to dive in deeper to one specific uh, focus on the content, webinars are a great way to do that. But I think they're even more helpful if you aren't able to come to a national meeting. And that way you can log in at your own convenience, um, hear the content from an actual research expert, and, and still access that same material that others have seen. Um, like all of our services, this is unlimited service. Anyone can sign up for these webinars. They're completely free and included in your membership. Um, and we archive all of our webinars. So if you really want to log into the Digital Strategy Roadmap webinar, but you're just not able to make it, we do archive all of them and paste them or post them on eab.com so you can log in at your convenience. So custom research is another extremely valuable membership service. Um, student affairs and the COE forum have taken uh, great advantage of our custom research service, um, but it'd be great to get some projects in for academic affairs as well. Uh, custom research is essentially designed to serve as an exact counterpoint to our best practices work. So the best practices work is high level, it's broad, um, it's not going to be super tailored or, or specific, um, whereas custom are projects that are designed by the member and we take all the work off your plates. So for example, you'll come to us with a question that, that's really plaguing you at your institution, and we'll go ahead and carry out all the research. Um, it involves our typical research process of, of interviews with other institutions, both within and outside of our membership. And then we type up a 15 to 20 page report uh, that is then yours to move forward with um, as you wish. So again, completely uh, valuable membership service. It is an unlimited membership service, but we do ask just to ensure equity in the membership that you complete one project before starting another. Um, but good news is that COE, student affairs, and academic affairs each have their own custom research queue. Um, so Diana and Phyllis don't have to fight when they want to get a custom project <laughs> into the queue. You each have your own dedicated custom research queue. And I think this is a great way to really see us taking work off your plate. So if you have research you just need to do, it's not fitting into your traditional day, let us go ahead and take it off your plate. On-site presentation, um, you are about to see one, so I don't know if I need to, uh, to delve too deeply here, but essentially we do offer one annual on-site presentation uh, for our membership. It is an included membership service, um, so it's on EAB. We'll go ahead and come out, and, and our, one of our research experts will deliver one of the presentations from our national meetings. Um, you all are seeing one of the presentations from this year, but just a quick note that you can request a presentation from the current year or any previous years. So any of our best practice uh, research presentations are, are available to you. Wow, we got to that pretty quickly. All right, so now I get to... Uh, Stop talking for a little bit. Um, would love, I know we have sort of a large group, but would love to hear from you all about you know, your top priorities looking you know, six to 12 months from now. Where do you most need to see progress? Uh, I have listed a few you know, top priorities that I typically hear on the left to get the conversation flowing, but if there are big ticket items that you all are working on, I would love to be able to send resources and follow up. So I would love to hear, uh, hear from you all. Yes. One of my projects is with operational excellence and supporting revenue generation, and that's been interesting and difficult to find revenue generation. I'm working on a project that's supporting revenue generation on campus, and it's been challenging to find best practices in higher education around revenue generation. So I'm not sure if your service would be able to look into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a lot of, we've covered that significantly within the business affairs form. I believe there's also a few existing custom reports within academic affairs, um, which I can send in, in, in follow-up, but what we could do if they weren't tailored enough or specific enough is, again, complete a custom research project. I mean, it might need to be a little more narrowly focused, but we could certainly complete um, a custom project on, you know, revenue generation strategies at peer aspirational institutions. So, certainly. Thank you very much. And what's your name? I'm sorry. Catherine Mitchell. Great. Thanks. Yes. Copy. Um, <laughs> copies to hand out. We're 
Yeah. 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 Inspired around it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. great. Yeah, you got to put in the details behind, uh, behind each one. Wonderful. This is why it's good to have research in the room. Um, yeah, that's, I forgot about that poster. I'll send copies of that. Yeah. And could you just say your name as well, just so I get a sense of who folks are? Hi, I'm Alex Schwartz. Um, I see on your list fostering multidisciplinary research. Well, my question is more about fostering multidisciplinary teaching. Um, so on our campus, we have departments. And um, then we try to do some interdisciplinary work for both interdisciplinary majors and for programs like the Big Ideas courses or this LNS Discovery courses. And um, we have a model now for releasing faculty from the teaching in their departments, but it's clunky and um, we've been using it for a long time and it's um, not always successful. So mm -hmm. I wondered what other institutions do to break down those departmental boundaries so te people, faculty can teach in other departments or for the college in interdisciplinary teaching situations. Sorry, just taking notes. Um, yeah, so we have definitely done work on interdisciplinary teaching, again, within our custom library. I can't think of a best practice. I mean, if you can think, I can't think of a best practice study that would speak to that, but let me go ahead and come through our custom research library. I can go ahead and get you some reports and follow up, and then same thing. If, if they're not tailored enough, not specific enough, that's when we would really go uh, to a custom project and see if we could, could answer the questions better that way. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Linda Song. Oftentimes the questions I get asked are things like um, MOOC strategy or something like that, but they, the faculty want to know what a specific subset of institutions are doing, sort of like what are Harvard, MIT, and the University of Michigan doing. Does your, would I be able to drill down that specifically on a specific topic? I mean, you're pro yeah, in a custom project, certainly. I mean, I think our, like we have understanding the MOOC trend, certainly Colin's presentation, of course, but those are best practice publications, so wouldn't be drilled down to that specific subset of institutions, but that would be a perfect custom. place for custom, because, especially because it's so narrowly focused. And what was your name again? I'm sorry, I missed uh, it. Linda, last name is Song. You guys might be fighting over custom projects. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my name is Patricia Donnelly. I'm with the School of Law, and I'm overseeing an online education initiative. First of all, is your online education strategy primarily focused on MOOCs, or is it? I'll it let him answer that. <laughs> So last year, um, and I'll speak to this in, in a little bit, but I spent a lot of time kind of following disruptive innovation in higher education that was largely about the, the threat that MOOCs posed or perhaps the opportunity. But our transition over the last, I guess, 12 to 16 months has been toward um, operationalizing some of those vague questions into a genuine online strategy for mm -hmm. department chairs, for deans, for colleges, uh, for extension units on campus, which tends to be a much more difficult, complicated set of questions. And there are you know, decades of best practices to look at there um, instead of just a few open questions about what MOOCs might mean. So we've done a lot, of works on, a lot of work on MOOCs, but I wouldn't characterize the corpus of our research on online as being MOOC-centric at all. And um, one of the challenges that we're having is there, there aren't a lot of law schools that have, of top tier law schools that have entered into the right. online education arena. And, um, you know, we'd like some information about, in general, I guess, professional school um, experiences mm -hmm. um, and also professional school strategies with regards to faculty compensation, which we found to be extremely mm -hmm. painful yeah. because there isn't a concept yet of the, um, online course being a multimedia publication that, that should include royalties for the faculty okay. member. So IP rights. Yeah, yeah, and all of that, yeah. Yeah, it might actually be useful to send you some of our work we've done in Future Students, Future Revenues. So we had a chapter of that that was focused on uh, graduate professional programs. So a lot yes. of folks have turned to those very heavily over the last decade or so, and sometimes they tend to subsidize the core campus or the residential uh, experience. But the MBA and the JD in particular 
are experiencing very difficult times. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and you really can't offer a JD online or even no. many parts of it. No, and we don't. We are Yeah, we right. don't even want to do that. So, uh, many of the strategies we outlined there, and I'm not the expert here, but I can connect you uh, with the folks who are, are using some of the same curricula and faculty to create innovative new program designs yeah. that are mm -hmm. a little bit more free from some of those, like the LLM, for example. Yes. A lot of folks use a very similar curriculum there. You can offer it. Uh, online to international students. Yeah, Sometimes that's what we're in the very already. Same classroom. Yeah, right, that's but, what we're doing right, right. now and uh, heading into. But we'd like more information about um, people's experiences with mm -hmm. certificate programs right. and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So. Right. But Great. so you all. No, that's have very some. helpful. Yeah, we can yeah. absolutely send you uh, that chapter of future students, future revenues, and a few other things and follow up. Absolutely. Fabulous. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Any others? Looks like. One quick question. Do, does our membership include access to the Business Affairs Forum? Uh, it does not. Um, okay. But essentially, my, my policy is just out of respect for our greater partnership. If there was a few reports you wanted to see out of the Business Affairs Forum, I'd be more than happy to share those on a one-off basis. So if something from the Business Affairs Forum appeals to you, I, I'm certainly happy to share it. Great. Thank you. Was there a particular report that appealed to you? Uh, okay. I, I and I promise I'll walk it over to you. How about <laughs> that? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm actually what's keeping me up right now in the next 18 months is um, ensuring that our portfolio around um, IT support for academic engagement and research activities um, are sort of robust. Um, both of those areas, I think, um, we have not been able to invest as, as heavily in as we might have liked over the past few years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, but the director of research IT and I are doing a very, very similar deep dive at pure inspirational and aspira or aspirational schools. We've named 10 of them already. Um, and our staff are doing, it sounds like, very similar work to what you would do in one of your um, sort of specialized reports. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I would say that's positive about engaging staff in the activity is that they're actually um, learning a lot about what's going on in the landscape themselves. Not that everybody has the time to do that, um, but in this particular case, it's actually been a great activity, although I think we'd be interested in sort of having you take a pass, a mm -hmm. look at what we're doing and perhaps being able to add to it, so. Absolutely, and often that's, you know, what cu where custom can be really valuable. Sometimes it's a completely original project, there's been no research done, but you know, oftentimes members will have done some research, done some deep diving in their own teams, and then just want to either affirm or refine or change sort of their existing knowledge. Um, and, and what was your name, just so I can follow up, I'm sorry. sorry. So that might actually be an interesting opportunity to get one or two reports from the Business Affairs Forum, because yeah. I think we've done two larger best practices study, one on the, what's happening in cloud computing. Um, obviously, a lot of things are moving to software as a service, but people are very skittish about security and other kinds of issues and outsourcing in general. Um, but a lot is moving there. And a few years back, we did a study called Reinventing IT Services, which might be somewhat relevant. Um, so. And in the future, uh, the firm in general is looking at CIOs as our next sort of major membership, which might be, um, might be interesting. I'm Wanda Lynn Riley, and, and not to take us off course, but also in the business affairs area, one of our strategic initiatives is around shared services. Mm. And so whether or not there's been any significant work in the business affairs forum around um, shared services. Very significant work. Um, that's one of our insight centers, and then we did a best practice uh, study on that, lots of custom. So yeah, I can absolutely send you a, a lot of shared services work. That'd yep. be great. No problem. Hi, I just wanted to say something about our internal process for the uh, custom reports. Um, Cynthia and I have agreed that um, we'll be the um, conduit to EAB for requests for the um, custom reports so that we can make sure that we're getting um, them in a queue and that we're not um, inundating them. So if you have interest in a custom report, get in touch with either Cynthia or me or both of us, and then we'll coordinate and make sure that we're um, you know, sequencing them well. Um, we do have one in motion right now actually related to shared services and the impact on academic um, the CIOs and the uh, departmental managers, so that's a custom report we're working on as we speak. And then I think, Cynthia, you have one coming soon after. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to say, though, I mean, that's just for the custom report service. 
Um, in other areas, Laura, are you happy to field requests directly from members of our community? Because we don't want to create a bottleneck except in that one area where we do have to prioritize. And so I would love it if people in the room could contact you directly just to yep. get guidance on how to maximize the use of the membership. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's my role. That's what I do. You each have my business card. So typically the first step, even before we jump to custom, because we have such robust libraries, there's about 580 reports in the Academic Affairs Library. I'll go ahead and take a look at what we already have. So if I can get you an answer immediately, that's better than you know six to eight weeks. So yeah, please come to me with your questions if you want me to sort of look through the libraries and pull things for you. And then that'll really help us even further prioritize you know, what can be answered with our existing research and what needs to go to custom. So. Yeah, yeah. Just feel free to and, contact and me. And Phyllis and I also have a, a, I don't remember whether it's monthly or how frequently we do it, but we have a regular call with Laura. So mm -hmm. if Laura finds out about a cust you know, some, you know, that she's been having some conversations and some, it looks like something could be a custom report, then we can feed information yep. both ways and sort of figure out how to handle the queue. Yep, exactly right. Here we go. Can, is it on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Rebecca Miller, and I'm working on a project um, to align and coordinate advising. So I'd like to add my voice to the concern about best in class advising. Mm -hmm. and, and we did have the future advising presentation here last year. Yep. Can you say how this, this one is different, the best in class? Best is that already a CAN presentation, or is it a? I'm sorry. No, this is more. Like this is more a list of concerns. Oh, so based okay. on conversations with academic affairs forum members, okay. what problems usually come up. So certainly the existing advising best practice publications are all about best in class advising. That's sort of a more general term we use. Um, so the presentation you've seen, of course, is a best practice publication. We have another best practice publication on advising. And at this point, over 15 maybe more custom reports on advising. Again, they differ between you know, selective publics versus smaller mm -hmm. students. I have to sort of send you what's most relevant. We have done a lot of work on advising. Um, is there a particular, well, do you want a more broad look at advising? or? Um, actually, I'm interested in how we're trying to deliver individualized, personalized advising in a highly distri distributed, decentralized environment. Mm -hmm. So if you have some research on how that's done in a professional way, um, we're also looking at assessing advising um, yep. at a programmatic level. So if you have information on that, fabulous. Yeah, I know we at least have one custom report on that because it was completed from one of my other members. Um, and at the time, we didn't really have much. So I at least know there's one custom report on assessment of advising. I'm not sure if there are others, but I can check. Yep. If I don't write things down, I'll forget. Uh, are there other big areas? Other? We have a good list, so this is great. All right, great. We'll move on for now, just looking at the time. But if there are, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Have you done anything on um, general education, breadth, um, core curriculum, however it's phrased in different universities? I know a lot of universities have revisited their um, breadth or core requirements recently, and do you do anything on that? Yeah, that would mostly be within the custom sphere, um, mm -hmm. so no larger best practice work in that area, but there are definitely some custom reports I can send you um, in that area. Does anybody do anything with assessing how it's working? Because to me, your um, goal of your breadth requirement is rather uh, um, long term. So you want to create educated citizens out in the world. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you know whether you've done what you're trying to do because your goal is so far in the future? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know that any of the custom reports dive think, into that, yeah. but I don't know. Colin, I think you might have put a your finger how do you assess? How do you assess it? I think you've put your finger on one of the reasons we haven't done a best practice study yeah. on this, mm -hmm. um, because everybody struggles with this and is currently or just completed a six-year exercise uh, to revamp their general education curriculum, but it ends up being a very difficult fight because everybody wants a piece of that, right. a piece of those requirements, especially sure. in a decentralized or especially an activity-based budgeting or an RCM system. 
uh, it creates a lot of incentive issues. And mm -hmm. as you said, the mm -hmm. way we tend to think about the outcomes of that tend to be very humanistic, right? right. Um, so there, we have a good understanding of what some of the problems are, and we've, uh, we've probably done a lot of interviews on it, but um, what we have would probably be in the custom library. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh, let me just add one thing. We did do a study on uh, measuring student learning outcomes, which is another area that you know, we spend a lot of time operationalizing those in language. Um, but then it's very difficult to get the next step toward turning those into metrics that could be measured, and then turning the metrics that can be measured into potential accountability mechanisms that could result in policy changes. So those two steps are much easier said than done. Um, the you Hi, Laura. My name's Diane Hill. I just had a comment, basically, that I'm very delighted to see in the COE forum, the various uh, aspects about market analysis. Mm. This is one of the areas that I think will be <coughs> excuse me, most helpful for Berkeley uh, in really f being able to be strategic about what new degrees to offer. Mm -hmm. The marketing analysis uh, has basically um, been creative, uh, a little, um, shall we say, thin in mm -hmm. some areas, mm -hmm. uh, but enthusiastic. And uh, I think to be able to anchor it uh, with more specifics, to be able to have uh, a disinterested party that, or mm -hmm. I in some ways, be mm -hmm. able to assist with this will be of immense help. So I just wanted to say I was really yeah. delighted to see that. I'm glad to hear that. And I can send you a few quick documents just outlining our partnership with Burning Glass, but our, our members have just loved it um, in the COE forum, just found it immensely helpful. Um, we formed the partnership about a year ago, so right when I came on board in August, we had just formed this partnership. Um, and yeah, it's been incredibly helpful, so I'm really glad to hear that there's, there's similar excitement on your end. That's great. Any other, and, and certainly this isn't the only time that, that we can, uh, I can help you all out if there are questions or areas where you'd like me to pull research after the presentation, my business card is in any one of those, every one of those folders, so you can certainly feel free to contact me after, but are there any other uh, top of mind priorities that you all can think of now? Yeah. <laughs> Two people have mentioned topics that I would also like the information on, so I'm wondering what an effective way would be for us to know what you're sending out so we're not I'm not emailing Diane and <laughs> so my and, yeah no that's yeah. a great question my strategy when it's this large of groups is typically to send it to you know maybe Diana Phyllis Cynthia and then let them sort of distribute it to the entire group or I have all great. of your email addresses I can send everything to everyone but that seems uh, you know a little more cumbersome so I can do whatever feels right to you all um, Mm -hmm. But maybe when you're having an email exchange with someone in our community, you could copy Phyllis and me so that if we see, wow, I think these other people would be interested in this too, we can help push it forward. Okay, yeah, that sounds and, great. And if we could okay. just post it on a B-Space or something that we all had access to, that would help a lot. Absolutely, yes. If there are custom reports that you see that you'd like to post up, um, I would encourage that. It's a great way to, to spread those around. Sure, that's a good question. All right, well, I'm going to move on just because I know we're a little bit limited on time. I think we want to take a break um, in a moment, but um, I'm here in the flesh, but that is also my picture. Um, so I, again, am your dedicated advisor. Anything you need, whether it's custom related, would like me to pull uh, resources from the library, on site, anything you need, I'm really your one stop shop. And I really do think of the dedicated advisor as an additional membership resource, so you're not scrambling using 10 different business cards to find what you need. So, again, encourage you to contact me if you need anything um, in follow-up to today or in the future. Um, I'm actually getting married in three weeks, so if you see an email from Laura, somebody else, if I file the paperwork to change my name, which who knows if I'll ever do that. So if you see it from somebody else, it's still me. Just look for the LORA. <laughs> Still up in the air. We'll see how things work out. We'll see how the next three weeks go. No, it'll be Laura Zotter, I think. Um, so. It's a lot of paperwork, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's multiple candidates. 
Um, great. Well, now's the time for any last minute questions you all have. We still do have about five to 10 minutes. So if they're just general questions, other requests, more than happy to take those now. Oh, the yeah. student success transformation, yeah. I don't think, sorry. I was asking about um, that Laura had described some projects that she said were not best practices research, but sort of were designing resources and tools. Maybe that would be useful for decision support or data analytics, mm -hmm. and I just was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the form in which those would be shared, because I'm familiar with your best practice research mm -hmm. reports. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great question. I think, you know, feedback from our members is that they'll come to meetings, you know, the content is so valuable, so helpful, but then, you know, again, it's sometimes like turning on a fire hose. It's so much content. How do we really take this back to campus and use it? So we are trying to think of ways, you know, very intentionally to help you all facilitate those conversations and next steps on campus. So we'll still have, of course, our traditional best practice presentations where provosts and other academic leaders will gather and, and talk through these issues and hear our content, but we're trying to counter those with online resources. So for the Student Success Transformation Center, that'll really be like an insight center for all intents and purposes where a lot of our best existing and future work on student success will be housed so folks can just quickly go to that center and get exactly what they need. Um, for things like the dashboard builder, that is, again, it's coming down in 2014, but it's envisioned as being more of a drag and drop diagnostic. So you all can actually use that to create your own personalized dashboards. So I think the direction that we're heading more generally is still want to have these high level, more broad presentations that are dealing with the, the highest issues in, in higher education, but also have these ways to make the membership experience more personalized um, and, and to have resources and tools to sort of facilitate the next steps on campus. Is that? Yeah, that's great. And I, I just wanted to say something about, you know, the Berkeley campus, which you, pro you guys are already probably aware of. But, you know, unlike in maybe some smaller colleges, our, our, se our most senior leadership is, you know, so sort of in demand, so, you know, so engaged at, at a high level that what we gather here today are really um, high-level decision support people across the campus. And mm -hmm. the more that, you know, I think we can make best use of our, um, our membership at the Berkeley campuses if we engage all the, you know, the brain power in this room, the folks who are doing um, high-level decision support for the most senior leadership yeah. and, you know, giving them tools and resources. Not, not to say that our senior leadership won't look at best practice research support, but I, I mean, I think this sort of new direction you're moving in is very valuable for us here. I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. I know my other members have said the same. You know, they still want the best practices work, but again, want those more personalized uh, specific tools. So I'm glad to hear that. Any other questions or comments? I know I'm standing between you and break. At least I'm not standing between you and lunch. I've done that before, and it's not good. <laughs> All right, great. Well, you all have my content information. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your time and your attention. I'll look forward to following up with, uh, with most of you soon. All right, thanks so much.